The tragedy and loss experienced by the Jewish people during the Second World War only increased the desire and willingness of the Jews to establish their own state in Palestine. In the immediate post-war period, Palestine was still under the administration of the British Empire by means of the mandate system that had been established after the First World War, and the empire found itself in the awkward situation of trying to appease both the rapidly increasing Jewish population in the region, as well as the native Arab community, while still trying to keep control for itself. I'm your host David, and today we're going to explore the political situation surrounding the First Arab-Israeli War. This is the Cold War. Britain was attempting to administer the region using the White Paper, issued in 1939, which limited land purchases by Jews, as well as restricted immigration into Palestine. Even after the end of the war, Britain was reluctant to admit survivors of the Holocaust, despite calls from US President Harry Truman to admit 100,000 survivors, as they feared the destabilizing effect this would have. The Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry, established in 1946, and tasked to recommend next steps on the situation in Palestine, recommended the resumption of sale of land to Jews, allowing 100,000 Jewish immigrants to move to Palestine, and that the territory become a UN trusteeship. The British did their utmost to ignore the recommendations of the Committee of Inquiry, and continued to pursue the goals of the White Paper. Of course, the underground Zionist movement, with the Jewish community in Palestine was working hard to bring European Jews to the region despite the official ban. Combined with this, the militarized wing of the Zionists conducted sabotage and terrorist attacks to complicate the goals of the British. An example of these attacks was the series of strikes carried out on June 17, 1946, where 10 out of 11 of the highways and rail bridges connecting Palestine to the outside world were destroyed. The British responded with wide-scale arrests against the Zionist leadership and activists. Like any good downward spiral, the Zionist response was the bombing of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, which served as the headquarters of both the British Mandate Administration as well as the British military headquarters. 91 people were killed in that bombing. So, as we can see, the Jewish population was quite unhappy with the situation in Palestine. This, however, was also the case with the Arab population, who stood to lose their land and livelihoods. They were in opposition to the recommendations of the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry, and violent protests and demonstrations broke out. There were even calls for the annihilation of all European Jews in Palestine. The British, unable to regain control of the overall situation in the mandate, appealed to the United Nations for a resolution. There were three prevailing opinions on how the Palestinian situation could be resolved. The first was the establishment of a single, multinational state similar to what had been set up in Lebanon. This particular option was favored by the British. The second option was the establishment of a confederation, like Yugoslavia or Switzerland, with significant autonomy for the members, but with a common foreign and monetary policy. The third option was the partition of Palestine into separate Arab and Israeli states. This was the option favored by the United States and by the Soviet Union. The UN established the Special Committee on Palestine to consider and develop a proposal for a resolution to the issues in Palestine. After study and consideration, the Special Committee returned with a recommendation for partition, the plan that had been backed by the United States and the Soviet Union. However, the plan needed more than just the backing of the two superpowers. It also required a two-thirds majority vote in the General Assembly of the UN. This was far from guaranteed as both the British and all the Muslim majority states were firmly against the partition plan. It was going to take significant effort on the part of the plan's supporters to get it passed. The vote, held on the 29th of November 1947, saw 33 countries vote in favor of the committee's plan for partition. 13 countries voted against it, while 10 abstained. The United States had persuaded the Philippines and Paraguay, both allies of the US, to vote in favor of the resolution. They had also brought significant pressure to bear on Belgium, France, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Liberia, and Haiti to change their nation's original stance on the resolution to vote in favor of it. It's no coincidence that these nations were major recipients of American financial support, 
including Marshall Plan aid, for the European nations. The Soviet Union had instructed its allies and satellite states to vote for the resolution, votes which were crucial to meet that two-thirds majority. Of all the socialist states, only Yugoslavia did not vote in favor of the resolution, as they abstained. So what motivated these decisions? For the USSR, despite its historic opposition to the Zionist movement, commonly seen as an ideological enemy of communism, pragmatism reigned supreme. Stalin believed that the partition of Palestine would weaken the British grip over the Arab world. He also predicted that the British opposition to the American-led plan would harm the Anglo-American alliance. Stalin was confident that when the Arab world became disillusioned with both the Americans and the British, they would then turn to the Soviet Union for aid and support, despite the USSR's initial support for the partition plan. It's interesting to note that the Soviets viewed several aspects of Jewish communal life in Palestine as being quite close to the kolkhoz, the collective farm. They also admired the strong union movement that existed in the Jewish community and overall hoped that the leftist Zionists would continue to strengthen and push for the communization of Israel. The American situation was more complicated. Public opinion was generally in favor of a Jewish state, largely in part as a result of the hardships the Jewish communities of Europe had endured during the Second World War. Much of the political establishment, on the other hand, was actually against the partition of Palestine and instead favored an international protectorate over the area. The State Department, in principle, was in favor of the British position in Palestine as the British were seen as America's strongest ally in the struggle against communism. President Truman, for his part, as well as his White House staff, favored the establishment of that Jewish state. This was a long-time continuation of his support from when he'd been a senator. We, of course, can't forget to take into consideration that the United Nations vote on Palestine happened just ahead of US congressional elections. It was accepted that voting in favor of the partition plan in the UN would translate into the support of the Jewish vote in those upcoming elections. American voters also viewed Palestine as an opportunity where the United States could fill the vacuum of international power left by the retreating British and French. Access to and even control of the region's oil wealth through this international influence was also seen as key in the American struggle against the Soviet Union. Okay, so with that explained, the UN passed the resolution favoring the partition of Palestine. But what happened next? The Americans, despite their support for partition, urged the Jewish leadership to proceed slowly and not rush towards independence. On May 8, 1948, Moshe Sharet, who would go on to become the Minister for Foreign Affairs for the future State of Israel, met with the US Secretary of State, General George Marshall. Marshall strongly advised against a declaration of independence, warning that the United States would not be in a position to help in the event of an outbreak of hostilities. Nevertheless, Zionist leaders voted six votes to four for the immediate declaration of independence, which was declared on May 14, 1948. This was one day before the official end date of the British mandate in Palestine. The next day, armies from Iraq, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria launched attacks on Jewish-controlled areas. The majority of the international community, including both the United States and the Soviet Union, as well as the United Nations, condemned these attacks. The only significant support the Arab nations found came from the Republic of China. One of the key questions in the lead-up to the conflict was the provision of weapons for the new state of Israel. The United States had declared an arms embargo on Palestine and refused to sell weapons to any of the sides involved. Israel, for its part, was able to raise funds from Zionist supporters and sympathizers. The future Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, collected as much as $50 million in the United States alone. In early 1948, the Provisional Government of Israel reached an agreement with Czechoslovakia for the provision of weapons. Czechoslovakia, for its part, had a very well-developed arms industry, and the Soviet Union had given its tacit blessing to allow the arms agreement to proceed. In March of 1948, the first shipments of machine guns, rifles, and ammunition began to arrive. This was subsequently followed with further deliveries of both tanks and fighter aircraft. The Jewish community in Palestine had also set up their own local small arms manufacturers, which included the production of ammunition, mortars, and submachine guns. 
In general, Israel had to arm itself by any means it could, and it had to do so clandestinely as a result of that arms embargo. The success they had in obtaining weapons was absolutely crucial for the success that Israel had on the battlefield once open hostilities broke out. At the time that fighting commenced, Israel had approximately 36,000 troops available, made up of members of the Haganah, Irgun, and Stern, and largely augmented by almost 21,000 conscripts who had been called up in preparation for war. The Arab forces, comprised of approximately 25,000 troops, many of whom had been trained under British tutelage, and in some cases were still under the command of British officers at the time fighting began. The first Arab-Israeli war lasted through 1948 and into 1949. We here at the Cold War plan on bringing you further episodes on the course of the war, the settlement that brought an end, temporarily, to the fighting and the international fallout that came from the creation of an independent Jewish state. To not miss this and more, make sure you're subscribed to our channel and to press the bell button. We rely on our patrons to create these videos, so consider supporting us via www.patreon.com/thecoldwar. This is the Cold War channel and we will catch you on the next one.